All right, perfect. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. My name is Daryl. I'm with Hitwise, a division of Connexity, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, the webinar today is entitled, A Look at Luxury Brands and Consumers in 2016. And uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First of all, all attendees will be on mute for the duration of the webinar. But you can ask questions, uh, text-based questions, via the GoToWebinar control panel. And go ahead and ask those questions at any time, and I'll compile those and ask those questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, another item, we are recording the webinar, and all attendees will receive a uh, on-demand version of the presentation after the webinar, so stay tuned for that. Um, also, a lot of the great insights that we are presenting today come from the uh, 2016 trend report, Luxury Brands Online, produced by PMX and Hitwise. And we'll also send all attendees a copy of that after the presentation. Um, great. So with that, I'm going to introduce our speakers today. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, first, we have Glenn Lalick. He is VP of Research at PMX Agency, and that's a global integrated marketing agency. And then, of course, our very own John Fetto, Senior Analyst at Hitwise. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. John? Thanks, Daryl. Um, just, uh, just one other piece of housekeeping um, information to, to keep in mind is you can follow us along today on Twitter at Connexity, that's at C-O-N-N-E-X-I-T-Y, and at PMX Agency. Um, we'll be tweeting along some, some stats during the webinar and would love uh, if you guys could follow up and, and uh, submit any questions there as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to get into a quick overview um, of Hitwise before we get um, before we get started. Um, hopefully, I'll, my connection is not too bad. Um, but uh, Hitwise, we'll give you an overview of Hitwise. So the the data that we are using comes from an online panel of roughly 8.5 million people in the United States, and that includes uh, 3.5 million mobile devices. Uh, which is the largest in the United States. Um, the data is captured not through cookies, but by various data sources, and those track virtually all web-based activity uh, that uh, individuals are engaging in, including secure. So effectively, this allows us to see the number of visits that a website gets, uh, how many people have been driven there from different sites like Google, um, social, email, news, and whatnot, and, and as well as the search terms that they use and whether they clicked on paid or organic links amongst other metrics and indications. Uh, the data allows us to kind of overlay consumer characteristics from our, our Simmons research partner as well, giving you the ability to build rich audience segments and learn more about their online behaviors, their attitudes, their media preferences, and lifestyles. And so on the next slide, um, just to get a little bit more detailed in terms of the data collection that we um, engage in in the United States, we measure, um, each month we measure about 500 million distinct monthly searches and 20 million websites are tracked via millions of, of, of devices used by our panelists. Those, uh, those site visits and search clicks then can be analyzed via our Hitwise platform or Audience View, um, and, and they are filterable by 177 different industries. Um, and this is the kind of data that Glenn used and PMX agency used when compiling the insights that he's going to review for their annual Lux, Lux report. So the next slide. Um, so why do we track this data and what do our clients get from it? Um, you know, marketers obviously have many questions about the activities of your target audience outside of your own site's influence. Um, and we, and we want to give you answers to those questions. So some of those questions that we answer for our clients are, who are my best customers? Um, who are my competitors' customers? What differentiates my audience segments from those of, of my competitors? Um, what popular destinations um, are, are there along my customers' path to purchase, as well as the path to purchasing on my competitors' site? Um, and how can I engage with my audience? What interests them? Um, what sites are they visiting? Um, what, what drives them and what motivates them? And then finally, where can I reach them? What types of devices, what industries, what channels are best 
um, optimized for engaging my, my customers. So with that brief overview, I'm going to turn it back to Glenn to really get into the heart of the data, focusing on luxury brands online. All right. Hi, everyone. This is Glenn. Thanks, John and Daryl. I am very happy to be here to celebrate the seventh year of publication for our luxury report, which PMX Agency produces in partnership with Hitwise. Uh, the annual study seeks to understand the success of today's luxury brands online, and we do use a lot of Hitwise data to do that. We look at site visits, brand searches, as well as social reach, and we're using those as proxies for growth and consumer engagement. Uh, and this year, we have 80 apparel brands that have been selected to serve as a benchmark for the luxury sector. And here you can see kind of a variety of those prestigious logos. They range from folks who are nearly 200 years old, like Louis Vuitton or Hermes, to relatively recent entries like Christopher Kane and Nicholas Kirkwood. So it's always good to sometimes step back and ask the question, why? Uh, why do we do a luxury study? And the most direct answer is significant sales and some growth per vein, global sales of luxury goods we $282 billion. 32% of that is the U.S., which makes, 32, which makes the U.S. the largest market. It's actually larger than China, Japan, Italy, and France combined. Uh, but aside from numbers on the softer side, you know, the luxury market is a study in branding. And I like to say this every time we talk about the study. You know, luxury marketers are, of course, expert at quality and craftsmanship. It's a foundation for all of these offers. But they are also expert or, or have proven expert at creating brands that are both captivating and resilient. They're kings and queens of invention and reinvention. And their progress and success is a lesson to marketers, you know, regardless of size, price point, and demographics. So a little bit of setup there. Um, we want to, uh, so we're going to provide some of the top line data from the report. As it was mentioned previously, you'll be able to get access to the full report uh, as a follow-up after this presentation. Uh, so we want to pull way back and kind of get a sense for the overall luxury brand land landscape. It's like who are the luxury online leaders? Uh, and by doing that, we want to look at which brands have the biggest share of total visits during the 12-month period of our study. So as you can see at the donut chart in the upper right, Ralph Lauren. If you go from Ralph Lauren clockwise all the way around to Versace, the top 10 brands uh, account for the vast majority of traffic. They capture 80%. Uh, and these 10 are pretty much the same as, as we reported in prior years, although there is some, some switching of rank, and Ralph Lauren is actually number one for this year's study. Another thing I would point out, aside from the top 10 occupying 80%, is the three, Ralph Lauren, Michael Kors, and Coach, come pretty close to occupying 50% of all of these searches. So it's worth noting that while these brands all have exclusive luxury offerings, They've also developed significant mid-market lines, kind of letting the authority of their brand cascade down to broader, kind of less affluent markets. So that no doubt accounts for how much larger they are compared to others. Kind of in contrast, if you look at Ralph Lauren, you kind of go counterclockwise up there, the off-white other luxury brands at 11.7%, there's actually over 60 brands in there, which are much, much smaller although they tend to be on the absolute luxury side, and some of them don't even sell direct, like Marquesa or uh, Shopparelli and things like that. So this is one way to look at the data. But we also like to look, so that's kind of the big picture, but we also like to look at individual stories and particularly to understand growth. So there's two chart tables here uh, that look at total visits. The one on the left is variance which is which luxury brands have seen the most success or positive change in, in total numbers, who has attracted more visitors compared to prior year. And uh, four of these brands in the table, Saint Laurent, Dior, Balmain, Longchamp, all grew 200,000 plus additional visits, uh, com visitors compared to prior year. Saint Laurent is number one with half a million. So that's one way we look at it. On the right side, however, is uh, a YOY variance by percentage, which is which brands attracted more visitors compared to a year ago as a percentage, kind of like relative to themselves. So we like to look at the data through this lens because sometimes it's a way to spot folks who are comparatively small compared to a broader set, but who have seen significant growth relative to their size. So Balmain is number one on this chart. Uh, it's all 68% growth year over year. This is actually the second year that Balmain has been in the top slot. It was actually more, even more tremendous last year, 327% growth. So once we've isolated who kind of the key players are, who's like seen the most movement, just kind of look for what they have in common. And both 
Saint Laurent and Balmain have undergone successful transformation in recent years. And there's kind of lessons for marketers from all walks of life. You know, why are they there? Well, for one thing, they both actively sought growth. And not to be discounted, there was a concerted effort to grow the brand. Both have new creative direction. And it's kind of notable, both of them have new creative directors who are 30-something. Uh, but there's also general re brand repositioning. The Eve is gone from East, you know, formerly Yves Saint Laurent. A lot of celebrity brand advocates uh, on the Balmain side, particularly Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. Heavy social presence and more expansive products uh, or product lines. Balmain has biker jeans, boots, sneakers, as well as a partnership with H&M. Saint Laurent has like leather products, which include jackets and handbags. So switching gears, but kind of still parsing out the same hitwise data that we can really use. We also like to get a better understanding of device use across the luxury set. And so the luxury market has always been tech savvy, but the stats here are still notable. Uh, the majority of traffic to luxury sites is mobile. The average across all 80 brands is 52%. That compared to 46%, if I looked at all the parallel and accessory marketers, it would be a couple of degrees lower than that. Also wanted to point out in the top of this chart in the brands, there's MCM and Michael Kors are the two that achieve 60% or more. Um, so they have that commonality, but how they got there is sort of an interesting contrast. And so we have just two examples here. On the left, you know, in one approach is MCM Worldwide. They specialize in leather goods with Munich born, now Korean owned. And their mobile approach is very brand centric. You know, they emphasize youth and world travel. There's great content, product lines named, you know, nomad collections, kind of like world citizen and aiming at millennials. And it's like, it, it speaks well, their focus to a mobile-centric lifestyle. So that's on the one side. On the other side, though, by comparison, Michael Kors mobile site is much more clearly designed as a shopping assistant. I mean, it serves all sorts of purposes, but definitely has a shopping assistant kind of feel in mind. It's, you know, filling like an omni-channel gap. Because when I load up the Michael Kors mobile site, it immediately looks at my geo to tell me where the nearest retail location is. It also kind of discreetly but consistently reminds me throughout that there's free shipping and returns. So um, with that, because those are two approaches, you know, they're aimed at their markets, if you will, and at the particular consumers. And it's probably a good time to let John talk about the luxury consumer. Okay. So working with, with PMX Agency, we, we created um, a, a custom website portfolio of the, the 80 some odd sites that they used um, in, their, in their larger analysis. And, and what that does is it allows us to look at the individuals um, who are actually driving those visits to luxury sites. So really these are the luxury consumers that we're trying to better understand and we can look at everything from demographics to attitudes um, as well as their other online behaviors and, and click streams. And so first off, we're going to look at some demographics. And we see that nearly, you know, um, nearly uh, every female age group that we look at over indexes for visiting, um, visiting these luxury sites. In fact, 62% uh, of luxury shoppers are, are women. Um, we also can see in those individual bars there that millennials and Gen X are really key generations uh, for luxury brands. Um, that's especially true on the female side, but we, we also see that males and Gen X are also over-indexing for visit luxury luxury brands. And as you get older, they do their, their, their propensity to visit these types of sites um, drop off. Um, and but every female age group um, over-indexes except for those age 65 and older. Uh, next up, we're going to take a look just at education and household income. Uh, we obviously see um, high levels of education among this audience. In fact, the majority of luxury shoppers um, have attended college with nearly half um, having actually had a college degree. Uh, and also, not surprisingly, household income is, is directly correlated with propensity to be a luxury shopper, um, specifically those with household incomes of $250,000 or more. Um, we're seeing that those, are 30, those, those individuals are 35% more likely than average to be luxury shoppers. Well, you know, that said, we still see um, even more shoppers, even more uh, numbers of shoppers in, among the luxury set that earn under 25000 So even though those higher um, income uh, segments are more likely to um, more likely to shop um, via luxury, these luxury sites, we still see a lot of activity 
even at the lower end. So that might be you know, aspirational in some regards. So the next slide, we're going to look at some of the attitudes. So, you know, beyond those basic demographics, we, we're using the audience, plat, audience view platform to understand what's going on in their mind. Um, and here on your screen, you can see some of the attitudes of the five or six hundred that we're able to filter through um, that that really help us understand what makes this, this group of consumers more more distinct um, attitudinally. Uh, for starters, they're they're about uh, 1.5 times more likely than average to say that they post ratings and reviews online. So, so they're not only looking for this information online, but they're also influencing others. They're also uh, 1.3 times more likely to um, to follow their favorite brands on social media. And I know that Glenn's going to be talking about that um, for luxury brands and social media in a little bit. Uh, so just keep that just that in mind that they're really heavily engaged with brands via social. Uh, they buy things on the spur of the moment. Um, they also use the internet to do to plan their shopping trip, which is a lot of, of, of what uh, online activity that we're we're looking at already in this presentation. Uh, they love gadgets and technology, and they always have to have the latest thing. Uh, they're they're among those that leading edge uh, when it comes to mobile payments as well, things like Apple Pay and Android Pay. So, you know, if, if you're not offering uh, this option, you know, it's, um, it's something, it's a missed opportunity. That said, you can also promote this as an option because, you know, not every retailer offers it and people who like to use their Apple Watch to pay for things might be seeking out um, retailers that they know will give them that ability to tap and go. Um, so the next slide, uh, we take a look at some of their um, some of their search behaviors. This one specifically focusing on their searches, um, driving visits to an apparel or accessory site. This will really help us understand like what's hot among this set right now, or at least what's disproportionately hot among this set. And and you'll see about eight items here on your screen that, that kind of visually represent what they're searching for. For starters, you see um, that the search term Chelsea boots is about uh, this, the luxury set is about 2.8 times more likely to be searching for this item compared to the average um, apparel searcher. I mean, in fact, you know, pretty much any type of boot we saw, over the knee boot, knee high boots, ankle boots, like every type of boot is pretty much more popular with luxury consumers. Um, also, this is something we saw last year, um, so presumably the trend is sticking around for a little while. We saw that um, the luxury shopper set uh, was about twice as likely to search for, uh, for sweater dresses as well as bomber jackets, um, so that's a good indicator of a luxury consumer if they're, if they're sporting one of those apparel items. Also interesting is that uh, luxury shoppers are you know, disproportionately interested in searching for baby clothes and other gifts for kids, but um, to note is that it's, um, they're probably not buying these things for themselves, they're probably buying them for friends and love to give them as gifts because if we look at their other search behavior as well as their demographics, um, they're not yet they're not yet married and not having kids of their own. Um, in fact, some of the searches that they're over indexing for include wedding guest dresses. And on the other end we see that they under index for searching for wedding dresses. So it's a bit of a kind of always a bridesmaid, never yet, never or not yet, um, a bride going on. Um, so it just helps us understand more about who they are and what motivates them. And so we'll look at a little bit more information about their, their digital behaviors or digital behaviors within the space um, from Glenn. Thanks, John. So yes, we've looked at what the key brand sites overall and the people visiting those, so visiting those sites. So one other way we like to leverage online visitor data is by looking at Clickstream to better understand behavior. And Clickstream is like where visitors were before they went to one of these luxury brand sites and where they went afterwards. So we're going to start with Upstream, uh, the overall sources of traffic for where folks were before arriving at a luxury brand site. And here, search engines account for over half of all visits. That's the, the light blue part of the circle down there. That's more than any other single source of traffic by far. And it's actually higher than what we see for apparel and accessories overall. The broader market is 42% from search. Luxury brands are 52%. Uh, you'll also see at the top then, smaller than navy blue is shopping sites. That means one in five visitors to a luxury brand site came from a variety of other shopping sites. That could be another luxury brand. But this is also, and we'll get into this in a little bit, other subcategories like department stores, pre-owned, and things like that. Uh, and then there is also social, where web-based social media drove about 6.3%. Uh, 
of, of traffic to luxury brand sites. So with the search being that dominant at over 50 percent, what kind of what kind of searches people are using is of interest. So we already know that two of the biggest types of search terms for retail are brand searches, which is say Gucci, or brand plus product searches like Gucci handbag. So this slide looks only at searches for brand name, brand name only. And for those types of searches, luxury brands command the lion's share of clicks. It's 70 percent. This is, you know, pretty much as it should be because there's nothing more valuable to a brand than its name and driving folks to the site. But it also speaks to intent. If I'm a luxury shopper and I search for Gucci, it's telling me I typically want to go directly to Gucci to get the full brand experience or a more complete line of products, content photos, etc. However, moving to the next slide, if I add a product term like handbag to a luxury name, so this is an example of Gucci handbag, the path I choose to take based on search results is a lot more varied. So for brand name plus product search, luxury brand sites, the blue up there, is 30%. That's less than half of the 70 that gets from pure brand searches. The things that grow instead are department stores, and Macy's is the biggest but not the only department store in that mix, or online stores like Amazon, Farfetch, Net-A-Porter, or pre-owned uh, from Tradesy. All of those grow like three, five, ten times more than they do based on just the, the luxury name. So brand and product terms typically indicate a stronger likelihood to purchase. So what we see here is that the clearer my intent is to purchase, the more likely I am to start considering my options. Maybe I want to see if the item is less expensive someplace or if I can get it pre-owned or maybe I want to shop for multiple brands at the same time. So the other thing we did uh, new this year is we, we looked at a couple different products. So one uh, brand name we also added was brand name plus shoe terms. Uh, and for this combination, luxury brands visits fall even further. They're close. The other one was handbags is 30 percent. This is 29 percent. But there is a lot more growth for department stores, um, which is up to 20 percent. And Nordstrom is the clear leader here, four and a half percent of brand. These luxury brand name plus shoes are going to Nordstrom. Online stores like Net-A-Porter grows. The only thing that noticeably doesn't grow that shrinks is pre-owned, which sort of makes some sense. So folks are not quite as interested in pre-owned shoes as they are in pre-owned handbags. Um, and just to finish up the clickstream um, side of things, so you know, uh, previously we looked at this chart, which is upstream, where 51% of traffic to luxury brand sites came from search engines. So, but there's also the downstream, or where they're going to. And if I, you know, if we look here, we can see that there is a, a really dramatic shift. Like 50 percent are coming from search engines on the left, but when they're exiting, it's far fewer, less than half are going back to, say, Google to keep shopping. That's still a big number. 19 percent is still like the biggest, you know, single thing to do of all. But what happens is there's a greater share of shopping sites. So um, it's like two out of five visitors exiting from a luxury brand site are going to something, you know, some other type of shopping experience. And I pulled out the perennials there. There's Nordstrom, Macy's, Amazon, Tradesy, the real real. And then social sites also grows. There's probably people going from a brand site to the, the brand sort of social. Um, and, and more than anything, we see it's sort of like if if I go through, if I if I go into a brand site, the odds are good that I'm in a shopping framework. Or I'm at least in a shopping research sort of mindset. So as John had mentioned, uh, another part of our study looks at social. Uh, technically, luxury brand site traffic ov overall is actually down a bit uh, this year versus last year, about 10 or 11 percent. But that is definitely not true of luxury social, which has grown significantly. And so here's a look at social media platform kind of YOY growth, I looked at it in a couple different ways. So the total, that 40% overall on the left, total luxury brand social media followers across these four key platforms grew 40%. But how that's distributed is interesting. Facebook was up 9% in terms of likes, but underneath there, Instagram grew 100%. It like doubled. And what that, what that means then is on the right, you'll see that in terms of the distribution, there's 479 million followers across all these brands, across all these platforms. Instagram is now pretty much equal to Facebook in terms of likes and followers, um, which, which is really 
really significant. And it all has happened, that tremendous growth has happened in the last sort of 12 months. Uh, keeping on the Facebook and Instagram thing just a little bit, is just um, on Facebook, I did pull together here the top brands with the most Facebook likes. That's the table on the left. So Louis Vuitton, Burberry, these are the folks that have 10 million plus. Uh, and, but the most notable story here is Chanel, which grew 2.5 million. It actually grew almost 2 million the year before. It wasn't even on this chart before. So it has seen like a significant amount of activity. Um, and the posts we pulled up here, we tend to pull up the posts which were actually saw them the, the largest number of likes. And so these are two examples, uh, you know, runway fashion shows, cruise 2016-17. Or the one with Gwyneth Paltrow is actually Spring Summer 2016 Haute Couture Show. Um, and there were other video assets. Chanel, in fact, has been like among the most prolific in terms of video content. They also have, not shown here, I'll show next, but like they also have among the highest, relatively speaking, among the highest engagement rates, Chanel does, with a 0.29. In this luxury set where there are lots of followers who are not necessarily interacting with a lot of posts, the average is 0.17. So, not quite double, but Chanel does, given its growth and size, sort of heartening that it's also seeing among the healthier engagement rates. And speaking of engagement, one of the additions to this year's study is actually not only looking at social media likes and followers, but we also added engagement for post metrics. And for Facebook, that would be like, you know, reactions, comments, and shares per post. And so a good example of why, you know, so it's looking at this through a different lens. We could look at the biggest players who have added the most, but there are smaller players who are actually seeing higher levels of engagements than the bigger players. And a good example is Italian shoe designer Giuseppe Zanotti, uh, which has a much smaller fan base. It's like 588,000, but its average engagement rate per post is 1.2. That's the highest is in, of this entire set. Um, now, and it's actually higher than the overall average, which I think would be like 1% for Facebook retail. So Zenodi's posts that we pulled out here, a sampling with the highest engagement were striking, to be sure. They're product driven. They showcase, you know, it's showcasing the, the brand's very distinctive shoe style through photos and some video as well. And then uh, I was also going to touch on Instagram just a little bit. So the table at the left here shows the brands with the largest number of Instagram followers. Uh, four of these have 10 million plus. Um, and you'll also notice the engagement rates are higher, just the nature of the platforms. Uh, folks are probably already well familiar, but you know, Instagram, it's easy to fly through photos and just tap on a heart. You know, a lot of those, Facebook is not quite that. It's like generally people are a bit more engaged before they like. So that accounts for some of that. Uh, but among the most popular, um, they tend to, to be celebrity, you know, based celebrity advocates. These examples here is the bottom one is Jennifer Lawrence promoting both Dior and The Hunger Games at the same time. And then I, I, there were many places to pull a Kardashian photo. That's just one we pulled here, just illustrating that kind of celebrity uh, as well. And so I, we'd mentioned before the growth that uh, Instagram grew enough to now pretty much equal Facebook. Um, and so this table, actually, if you look at the additional followers, you know, it's the second column from the right. That shows you like who gained the most. So Chanel, Louis Vuitton, Dior, they, all of these folks grew 3 million plus Instagram uh, followers over the past 12, 12 months, which is great. Um, not all, some of the bigger brands still have a larger number of Facebook followers than Instagram, but the majority of these brands, of these 80, 62% now have more Instagram followers and Facebook followers. And some of the more interesting dynamics of that are a little below this fold. I pulled out on the right, Balenciaga, Facebook followers 1.1 versus Instagram 2.2. Tom Ford, Facebook has likes actually 1.3 versus 3.3 million for Instagram. And Moschino is, is the same, actually the biggest of these. So just, you know, it, we thought it looked like a story last year and everyone is well aware, but it's really, it's really uh, fascinating to see the numbers and just how rapidly they have grown. And the last thing, another you know, byproduct of we're sifting through a lot of social for this year's report and looking at those which got the most traction, the most likes, et cetera, the, most, the highest engagement. Um, I, we did note some themes that people tend to, to stick with that work. 
Um, Nicholas Kirkwood on the left is very much a product-focused approach. Um, they highlight, it's a, you know, it's a British shoe designer, a lot of highlighting of shoes, but they also promoted a campaign across the various social media platforms that encourage followers to submit photos of how they wear their luxury footwear. And I think the, it was like the show us yours campaign, which is clever. Uh, in the middle uh, is Christopher Kane, which is a more traditional red carpet and runway, but seriously, runway show videos are widespread and endemic to luxury social platforms. So, and these are, you know, there was a spring summer events in London, but there's also Anne Hathaway in a custom dress at a film premiere. And then on the right is one of the more interesting ones was Brioni. Uh, it's Italian menswear label. Brioni recently altered its logo to a Gothic font. And so we've, we've got product focus on the left, red carpet and runway. And then there is the occasional using the various social platforms to help, you know, reinvent or relaunch. So, there's the new Gothic font. They actually introduced the brand with its new logo on Instagram, which is a logical place as the new creative director, Justin O'Shea, is an established Instagram celebrity, or he was already. And then they brought in Metallica, which is just an interesting, uh, interesting contrast to the Kardashians, et cetera, where you get the celebrity for intense reach. But this is like, there's certainly some reach, but it's more about re having folks rethink, reimagine what the brand is about. So. Um, and I think on that note, since I'm on the celebrity bent, I think John has more to tell us about celebrities. Yeah, so um, every year we do this this uh, webinar, we thought uh, it would be fun to repeat uh, the slide that we just looked at last year. And we looked at the celebrities that kind of enjoy above average um, interest among the luxury set, as we just mentioned. Um, you know, uh, Brioni was, you know, incorporating Metallica, but and there are definitely some celebrities that enjoy very, very popular. Uh, that are very popular among the luxury set. We, you know, mentioned the Kardashians. You can't pretty much, you know, throw a stone without hitting a Kardashian in the luxury set. Um, so I could do this entire slide just filled with members of the Kardashian and Jenner clan. But I did want to point out um, an interesting finding that among people, luxury searchers who are who are um, looking for celebrities. Um, in social media, uh, Black China and Rob Kardashian are actually much more um, have a much higher uh, share of luxury consumers among those people searching for them than even um, you know Kim, Kanye, and Khloe Kardashian. Um, they're about 7.8 and six uh, times more likely to be luxury shoppers. Um, we also see that Drake has about enjoys above average interest among this set, being 6. Point, searchers are 6.6 .6 times more likely to be luxury shoppers. Uh, Harry Styles, Amber Rose, Lady Gaga, of course, um, Selena Gomez. I think these are celebrities that you would probably assume would, would be fairly popular among luxury consumers. But maybe another one that, that might be an opportunity to partner with uh, would be Kelly Ripa, who um, enjoys like twice as, as a great of a, a, a fan base among luxury consumers than average. So just understanding kind of what these celebrity, what these consumers are searching for can identify some opportunities in terms of, you know, of celebrities to partner with. Um, and we are going to kind of close the presentation up by pivoting just slightly um, into the holiday season. Uh, we know that it's not even Thanksgiving yet, but our clients have been asking for us, for this information from us for months. Um, that we, so we started pulling our list of hot products and hot toys each week, and we're updating it on our, our Facebook page and on our blog. Uh, so if you are interested in that, you can check it out. Um, but we wanted to kind of take a look at some of the holiday products that you might expect luxury shoppers to be searching for, whether they're gifts for themselves or for others. And what you're seeing here on your screen, they're not necessarily the top hot products among luxury shoppers, but they are among those that luxury shoppers are um, searching for at disproportionately great rates. So the one you see on the upper left here is um, the Dyson hair dryer. It's like a $400 hair dryer. It's a, um, people searching for it are about 3.8 times more likely to be luxury shoppers than average. Next, you'll see um, they're more than three times more likely to be searching for uh, bands for the Fitbit Charge 2. While you can't use um, your Fitbit to pay for things in stores yet, it is something that's coming. So as we mentioned earlier, they're interested in that mobile payment or um, you know, tap to pay. So Fitbit is a really good um, connection 
for uh, for the luxury audience and, and customizing designer brand bands and things like that makes that makes good sense. Le Creuset, uh, the people searching for it are about three times more likely to be found in the luxury audience. Um, Apple AirPods, while probably not really an opportunity for this holiday season, given the fact that they were just pushed back to 2017, they will have uh, luxury consumers kind of waiting uh, anxiously for them next year. Um, you also see personalized gifts. So people um, in the luxury audience are searching for personalized gifts at about three times the average rate. And of course, it's not necessarily a luxury item, but it does speak to the fact that this that this set of consumers want something unique and personalized. Um, and then, you know, the last item that I that I threw in there is the Yeti tumbler. Again, it's um, it, it's not necessarily something you would expect to be um, favored by uh, luxury consumers. I think it, it kind of owes its its real launch or uh, launch into popularity to um, to the country music set. But it is still about a forty dollar tumbler. Um, and so just like the Dyson hairdryer and Crusade, these are like kind of top of the line or expensive high-end products that uh, really appeal to this audience. And then the last slide of the main part of the presentation we'll look at is just kind of a bonus piece. And Glenn and I were, were speaking about this in preparation. And so we thought we might um, do a slide of analyzing it just a little bit. Um, and as you guys are aware, subscription boxes are, are, are big and they're only getting bigger. Uh, the luxury set is especially fond of them. So, for instance, they're 17 times more likely to visit La Tote, uh, 15 times more likely to visit Trunk Club, 13 times more likely to visit Birchbox. Um, and while the contents, right, of these boxes aren't necessarily designer or luxury, they do um, they do often have that curated or personalized uh, feel, which really does appeal to this group. Um, and it's not really even just um, apparel or accessory uh, boxes that, that appeal to them, but they're also more likely, uh, eight times more likely to visit uh, Blue Apron and, and HelloFresh and, and this n relatively new site, Quip, um, which is uh, delivering kind of a subscription to very, um, very beautiful toothbrushes uh, for about $25 for a three-month uh, 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 subscription. Um, I actually wrote an entire report about the subscription box industry that you can download from our website. So if this is something of interest, I do suggest um, going and checking it out. It does make a lot of sense to kind of um, freshen up on this heading into the holidays because it does, we do see a boost to this to this industry right before the holidays, and luxury consumers are sure to be um, part of the, the set driving it. So that sums up about the main portion of the presentation, and I think we have a few takeaways from Glenn, and then we'll see from Daryl if we have any questions. Yes. Thanks, John. So yes, five takeaways uh, from the report this year. Number one is searching high and low. Online search remains luxury brands' biggest source of traffic but many prospects will keep shopping, so exclusive content, product offerings, whatever helps to differentiate or produce a rich brand experience is key. Think social, think visual. Social is luxury's second biggest source of traffic, and the more highly visual platforms like Instagram have seen tremendous growth. Mlux to mCommerce, on the one, the one path, luxury consumers are among the most digitally savvy. On a separate path, more and more people are purchasing via mobile, so those will collide or converge. Star-studded celebrity brand advocates come with immense, shareable, cross-promotable fan bases, but they can also help define or redefine brand perception. And then the last one, more to John's final slides, beyond apparel, luxury consumers seek sort of distinct, sophisticated products, regardless of price point, but some, you know, the, the idea of the curated gift boxes has a sophisticated um, feel to it. They seek those out in every aspect of their lives, creating opportunities for many sectors outside of the luxury apparel and accessories. So and with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to Daryl. Awesome. OK, great. Thank you so much, Glenn and John. Uh, great presentation and fascinating insights. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in, so we'll take a look at those. Um, a few things before we do that, though, just a reminder. Um, we did record the presentation, and we'll be sending out via email tomorrow to all attendees, so stay tuned for that. And then also, uh, you'll get a copy of the 2016 Trend Report, Luxury Brands Online. 
uh, produced by PMX and Hitwise, which goes even further into these insights. So uh, stay tuned for that. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these questions coming in. Um, and then this one could be for Glenn or John. It is, how do you define the luxury shopper when creating your profile? Someone want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so as I kind of mentioned um, earlier, what we do with, um, with the audience view platform, uh, we took the, the, the list of sites uh, that, that Glenn had used to analyze. I think he's about, Glenn thinks it's about 80 sites. Um, that you're looking at, and yes. and we look at and we look at people who visit uh, those sites, and then so we can kind of create an audience based on that. So we're looking at the individuals who who visit those sites. We can learn more about their demographics that we reviewed. Um, so it's really just anyone who um, who visited one of those uh, luxury brand sites uh, found in this analysis. Great, great. Okay, and another one. Um, what is, this is probably refers to uh, one of the specific slides, what is the multicultural demographic? And don't Hispanics, African Americans, and Asian demographics over-index significantly in luxury? Glenn, I do remember looking at some of that. I don't know if you remember off the top of your head. I know for a fact that I saw that Asian uh, Americans did really performed really well in among the visitors to those luxury sites. I don't recall if African Americans or Hispanics did or not. Um, no, I, I don't actually recall that either. Uh, we can. I, I don't have that information handy. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, we didn't run the ethnic overlay this time. Okay. Okay. We can get That's back. Okay. We can follow up with you on we that. We can probably I do get back know that that. Asian Americans. Yeah. yeah. All righty, um, let's move on. So the next one is about the celebrity slide. So how are these stats derived for, for the uh, celebrity statistics? So what we did, again, we took that, that same audience of people who visited any of those luxury uh, sites that were used in this analysis, those 80 sites, and then we looked at the searches that were driving visits to social media, so Instagram or Facebook, Twitter, or anything that we would classify as a social media site, um, and then we looked at you know each individual, you know thousands and thousands of search variations, and we and we pulled out those of, of kind of top celebrities and looked at their search rate among the luxury audience versus the total uh, online population. That way it helps us identify the propensity of the luxury shoppers to be searching uh, for, for each celebrity included in this analysis. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. All right, on to the next question. Um, how or can, can this information be applied to the hospitality industry? I mean, I think yes, absolutely, Glenn. I don't know if you have any uh, any specific thoughts about how, but you know, as we as we see, um, you know, luxury shoppers are looks are looking for luxury and and sophistication and quality and uh, and all aspects of their lives, whether it's in their kitchen or you know in their car taking their coffee to work. So obviously, you know, understanding you know how to engage them via a trans hospitality um, sector would, would make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, especially, you know, for, I, I assume we're talking about kind of high-end offerings for, you know, hospitality of sorts, and yes, there's there's huge crossover, uh, and, and also in approach, et cetera, for how hospitality works versus how these kind of apparel and accessory folks build out their brands. So, yeah, there's a tremendous amount of synergy. Gotcha. Right. Right. Okay. So a few more questions. This is good. Um, really interactive here. Okay. Another question is, are you finding that this segment is searching across luxury liquor brands as well? Who would like to take that one? 
Um, I didn't look at that. Um, it would be easily uh, discoverable, though, if we would, if you wanted to take a, a glance. We have the, the audience set up, so I would just uh, probably recommend that we can take that one offline and look uh, follow up directly with the person who asked it. But um, it's not it's not difficult for us to obtain that information. We just didn't have it, I think, ready for this. But um, I'll let Glenn, you know, confirm if he had any other insights on that before moving on. No, no, we did not look at that particular angle for the report, but we can certainly follow up and work with you, John. Gotcha. Okay, that's what I thought. Yep. Um, one last one we have is what kind of uh, web pages do luxury consumers visit? All right. Um, so, so obviously we saw... Pretty, pretty, pretty general. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we saw there's a huge influence of so, you know, in social media. Um, I would expect sites like Instagram to do really, really well, seeing as that, you know, as, as the number of followers that some of these brands have on Instagram is is equal to that of uh, of Facebook. Um, beyond that, I, I haven't looked at a lot of the other online industry information, though. I'm sorry. Could you? What was the question again? I'm sorry, Daryl. It was, what kind of web pages do luxury consumers visit? Okay. In, in their analysis, Glenn, I don't know if you looked at other industry, just like a, a, a standard industry profile report, but I mean, it is something standard that, that a lot of our clients do use uh, the HitWise and audience view data for, so it's pretty easy to obtain that. I don't have it in front of me, though. Yeah, I don't either. I do. Up. I will say, you know, you know, I will, you know, not necessarily speaking to specific sites, or, but um, I would, you know, look at the influence of mobile, and more like the device that they're using to visit sites. Um, so, regardless of what site they're visiting, I would say that mobile is probably one of the devices. It's probably the device that's becoming their their go to um, their their go to device when it comes to accessing the internet. So we saw a lot of these luxury sites are. Are skewing heavily mobile even more so than the average apparel industry and, and apparel and, and retail is already skewing ahead of the the internet as a whole. So not just understanding the sites that they're visiting, but understanding the device and, and knowing the, the importance of mobile in reaching luxury consumers, I think is important. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. And I think a lot of these questions can be answered kind of by digging further into our proprietary data um, and then kind of taking a look at, at what the, the results show. Um, we have, and it might be the case for this next question too, have you looked at the pet food industry and received luxury science and natural brands? Do shoppers behave the same way? Um, and is, it, is that, did we pull data on that or is that probably something that we have to kind of go back into? I did, yeah, I did I, not pull this in that particular sector. Yeah, I didn't pull that, but I, I will kind of refer back to, I mean, uh, uh, the, the attitudinal slide, and I think one of the bullet points that I didn't have the time to mention, uh, but was their, their uh, increased propensity to say that they would pay more for things that are environmentally friendly. So if there's like natural or organic or environmentally friendly products, even if it's in the pet food, pet, pet food space or even you know, packaging or automotive, I think the luxury audience would be more likely to kind of um, to, uh, you know, fl flock to those types of products and, and even be willing to pay more for them. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Glenn and John, and then um, if there are additional questions, you know, I encourage um, the audience to connect with us via the um, email address or the channels that we have displayed on the slide here. Um, we're happy to help and help kind of dig into our data to help you with uh, whatever types of campaigns that you have going on or, or additional questions that you may have. All right, and I think um, with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up, unless John and, and Glenn, did you have anything else? I don't know. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, no, awesome. thanks, everyone. Great, great. Okay, thanks again, and um, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.